If you would like our free newsletters on various religious topics, just send us an email at cdebater at aol.com and free newsletters will be sent to you by mail. Just provide your postal address in your email. The following are samples of some of the newsletters we have available. Does God Believe in Atheists? Part 1 Seventh-day Adventism, True or False? The Agony of Deceit The Origins of Muhammad's Religion Spiritual Warfare Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts or Demonic Spirits? Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. From Tradition to Truth, a Priest's Story. An Evaluation of the Oneness Pentecostal Movement. Mormonism, Counterfeit Christianity. Turn or Burn. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Links to these newsletters can also be found at our website www.biblequery.org Once on the home page, simply click on the menu icon at the upper left-hand corner. Then click on the Newsletters button. Feel free to print them out. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so I learned that while truth matters, life matters more. And I, I started studying uh, what was communicated by the progeny of Watchman Nee, said to me, truth matters, life matters more. And so I learned that while truth matters, life matters more. And I, I started studying uh, what was communicated by the progeny of Watchman Nee, said to me, truth matters, life matters more. Another major reason Hank Hanegraaff left biblical Christianity for Eastern Orthodoxy is in his own statement, which is as follows. You open those cathedral doors, and suddenly the smell of incense. You hear the bells. You see the icons, and it's all foreign to you. So you need some contextualization. And I think for most Protestants, they do not have that, and therefore sometimes they fear the worst, end quote, says Hanegraaff. So Hanegraaff needs the smell of incense. He needs to hear bells. You might say the smells and bells. And to see icons on the walls and on the ceiling of dead people. And this is to give him more spirituality. And that's why Eastern Orthodoxy has become the religion for him. <laughs> Bible answer man, Walter Martin, you're on the air. I'm calling to find out if there's any scriptural basis for marital separation. Stay tuned for the answer to this and other important questions as the Christian Research Institute presents Dateline Eternity with Professor Walter Martin, the Bible answer man. Professor Martin is the founder and director of the Christian Research Institute, San Juan Capistrano, California, and professor of comparative religions at Melody Land School of Theology in Anaheim. The Christian Research Institute is supported through the gifts and prayers of people like yourself who are interested in straight answers from the Bible. We hope that as this program of pre-recorded questions and answers unfolds, you will find answers to your questions. Of course, the ultimate answer to all questions is Jesus. Christ. Who is Walter Martin? Professor Martin, founder and director of the Christian Research Institute, is widely acknowledged as the outstanding evangelical authority on pseudo-Christian cults and the study of comparative religions in America. 
He has debated some of the most controversial intellects in this country through his popular radio and television ministry and is the author of numerous articles in national magazines. His best-selling book, Kingdom of the Cults, has become the primary reference work in this field. In Walter's excellent 1980 tape series on Romanism, which included the titles Justification by Faith, Purgatory, Roman Catholic Mass, Mary, the Mother of Jesus, Penance, and Peter the Rock, Catholic Church Tradition in the Bible. As Christians, what ought our attitude to be? It ought to be an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of joy, because God has delivered us from this system into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. We are not the descendants of this papacy, nor do we wish to be. We do not wish its sacraments. We do not wish its dogmas. We worship only Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, Redeemer and Savior of lost men. We reject a corrupt church, a backslidden church, an apostate church, and reach out to her people with the love of Christ, holding forth Holy Scripture, as Strossmeyer said, and standing upon the liberty wherein Christ has set us free. Let us not think that Rome has changed her basic positions. She has not. Her catechisms are essentially the same. Her dogmas, uncompromising. It is the same Roman Catholic Church as at the Council of Trent, only carefully adapted to American Protestant culture. It is a Roman Catholic Church which today threatens Protestantism in various parts of the world whenever she gains the upper hand. Spain, Central America, Latin America, Italy, Ireland, bastions of Roman Catholicism are known for their marked intolerance of Protestantism, for their unwillingness to let Protestants build churches or only a restricted number are permitted. And still we are told that the church has adapted to the 20th century. No, the church has adapted to the necessity of survival in the 20th century as she always has, but she has never changed the position. Peter is not the first pope, nor does he have the power, his descendant, that is, have the power to legislate for Christians. When he tells you that he thanks the Virgin Mary for sparing his life when he is assassinated, and yet he is the vicar of Jesus Christ by profession, then I think it's time to realize that is the kind of leadership we do not wish to follow and we wish to discourage other people from following. His other articles on Romanism from his Ford magazine, such as Charismatics and the Cult of Mary, which included his classic Seven Steps to Deity article outlining how Romanists have made a goddess out of the Virgin Mary, which actually references back to his book from 1960, which proves how Professor Martin exposes the false Roman Catholic religious system. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I'm the director of Christian Answers. And I want to thank you for being with us today for another episode of Christian Answers Presents. And as usual, I have one of my very favorite special guests with me on the program, Rob Zins. Rob, great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. Great to be here. It's always, it's always a, a, a mighty pleasure for me to have you here. Uh, and I get a, you get a lot of fan support out there among my channel subscribers on C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television. Uh, so I, as we get into this show, a lot of my viewers already know who you are. Uh, what I'd like you to do real quick is, because we've got time limits here to do this show. Mm -hmm. We don't have as much time as we usually have because of other mm -hmm. factors. So we're going to kind of rush through what we can get through in the time we have available. But just briefly, just tell our new viewers who you are. 
My name is Rob Zins, and I have been doing videos with Larry since 1990. And uh, he and I are no stranger to doing videos together. And if you look on YouTube, I think you'll find that uh, we've done this um, many, many times. But I'm honored to be here again as Larry's guest. And I have a special burden on my heart today. Most of my work is done in apologetics and exposing the Roman Catholic religion for what it is. And I've done the main work of my life in writing books and articles and an entire website designed to help Christians understand the Roman Catholic religion and witness to those who are lost in that religion. But today we're going to do a special video on something that's very dear to my heart, and that's the area of apologetics and the trustworthiness of those who have the responsibility to be perfectly honest and perfectly faithful to the Word of God and yet, for some reason or another, there are several of them out there, and we're going to discuss one such person who have a streak of deceit, I would call it. And uh, we're going to expose this kind of deceit and, and this kind of double speak and this kind of misinformation and actually the disingenuous uh, presentation many times of the Word of God uh, by uh, some of these uh, false prophets and uh, uh, they're really false apologists, in my opinion, because they're not staying steady with the Word of God. So we've selected one such person, and uh, we'll try to be as honest and direct as we can in this video to expose the error of this way and to warn Christians, be very, very careful with this man and this entire ministry that he is promoting. Okay, very good, very good. Now, uh, as we get into this video, I just wanted to mention real quick a couple of items. Uh, first of all, it, this is a very, it happens to be on this day we're recording my birthday. I just turned, at the time of this recording, I just turned 62. You don't so, look a day over 60, really. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that compliment. I appreciate it. So anyway, I thought it'd be kind of cool because it is my birthday and I'm, the Lord's already blessed me with a great birthday present, having two of my favorite people here with me. Good old Rob Zins and of course behind the cameras where no one ever sees him, but uh, my video uh, man, uh, those are two of my favorite people in the world. And on my birthday, I get, to have, I get to be with both of them at the same time. It's wonderful. And I uh, just thought I'd share this. And I saved it as a surprise for myself just for this video. Uh, my, my daughter, uh, Marlena, gave me a birthday card. And so I'm going to open it right now for the first time ever and see what she gave me. I don't have a clue what it is. So I'm with the viewers here. I don't know any more than, than they would know. And so let's see what she gave me. She gave me a chrome metal auto emblem of a UT Longhorns football helmet. So I guess I've got to add that to my car now so she won't be insulted. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, anyone that knows me, I graduated from the University of Texas. I've got a degree in advertising. Of course, I got saved two weeks after I got my diploma mm -hmm. from the University of Texas at Austin. And after that, all I cared about advertising was Jesus Christ. Right. And by God's grace, he's allowed me to do it now. For all these years, I got saved in 1981. So I've been advertising Jesus Christ uh, well, that whole time. Well, her timing's pretty good because that University of Texas football team is making a comeback. Yeah, they thank had you. a great win against Georgia in yeah, that bowl game. That's right. Many you, of them picked him to see, be popular. See, so, he's so good at this football stuff because you used to be a football coach. I did. And you used to play. You used to play football. Right? I did. What was your position? Outside linebacker, and I coached in Texas of all places. All right, 5A high school you, down in Houston, Texas. You couldn't find. In fact, I'm I was uh, I'm from Houston, Texas, and you couldn't have coached in a better state. So you're you're doing great on that, brother. I could have been in a better state <laughs> of mine. I wasn't a Christian at the time. Right, I understand. But but anyway, to go on with my daughter, I thought I'd just, since she gave me that wonderful present, and thank you, Marlena, if you're seeing this video. But I wanted to mention to my viewers at home that my daughter, Marlena, got saved, I don't know, over a decade ago. We got born again, and uh, she's devoted her life to Christ, and now she sings music. She writes her own songs uh, and performs them also. And they play her songs on the Christian radio, which is cool, you know. Wonderful. But uh, she's, she's written two Christian albums. Here's one. one her, her first album called Win This Fight, uh, Marlena Christine, that's her middle name. And uh, in here's uh, all her songs that she did, but uh, just to show this to the folks at home, there's a picture of my, 
my oldest baby, uh, uh, Marlena, and she really loves the Lord and sings unto his praise and glory. And uh, so that's album number one. And I'll just set this down for now. By the way, I'm going to give these to Rob after we leave as a little present uh, for coming out here to Texas to do these videos. And then here's our other uh, CD album called God Created. And uh, that's an 18-week-old ultrasound of my third granddaughter, Ona. Mm. Uh, and uh, inside, of course, is her eight songs that she wrote and performed, except for the last song on here is uh, When I Can Read My Title Clear by Isaac Watts. But it's a, a great rendition of that, uh, that famous hymn. Uh, so anyway, I'm the proud daddy. And of course, Rob's going to get these at the end of the show. And uh, before we lead into what Rob's going to be talking about, I want to kind of set things up. First of all, Rob mentioned we've been doing videos since 1990, which is almost 30 years ago now. Right. And right. Uh, so I thought people would have a, some fun seeing what Rob looked like. Back in 1990, when we did our very first show together. And so, just for a few minutes here, you're going to see a clip from Rob and me back in 1990 when I did our first show, which started a 16 hour, 16 part video series mm -hmm. that played on cable access TV in Austin, Texas, and surrounding areas to 400,000 households back then uh, for years. So, had a had a nice impact for the the Lord's glory. So check that out. And we'll be back after that. I want to make sure that if there are Roman Catholics uh, who are going to be watching this video, you know, our Roman Catholic theologians, priests, uh, lay people, that you will understand that we freely admit, at least I do, that the Protestant community has been guilty of some of the same types of uh, oppression and persecution Exactly. that runs contrary to this non-carnal, non-violent uh, way of thinking that's given to us in the New Testament. Uh, we cringe at the thought of the Puritans leaving England due to the persecution of the Roman Catholic religion upon them, establishing a colony in Massachusetts and immediately running off Roger Williams to Rhode Island because he disagreed with them. We understand that our history too is checkered with this type of statist church commingling that really has nothing to do with the gospel of Christ because you cannot protect the gospel with the sword. And we're not saying that. What we are saying is that the sword was the protection of the theocracy of Israel and in history it has been used by the Roman Catholic religion and on some occasions by those who deny Romanism as a method of enforcing of a, a religion. So I'm not trying to build a straw man here. Uh, that, that, that we're blowing away. We understand the air exists on both sides, but we are exposing here the elements of Judaism that are very similar to the elements of Roman Catholicism, a system to reach God that runs contrary to the simplicity of the biblical record. Right. It's not that the Protestants have not violated the same thing you were just mentioning. What, we're, what this is pointing out is this is the New Testament uh, precedent. This is what it's saying to do, not saying that Protestants haven't messed up there themselves exactly. in that case. Okay, so we just went down memory lane there with, with Rob. I, I also wanted to mention a little memory lane of, of myself because I, I've been doing television, cable access television since 1985, but I've been doing evangelism uh, uh, ministry since 1981, the year, very year I got saved, I couldn't help myself. Got a degree in advertising, got to advertise Jesus. So I didn't waste any time. I was, mm -hmm. I was an expert, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, I was doing, uh, I was director of evangelism ministries at our church. It was called Dayspring uh, Evangelism. But back then in the early 80s, uh, some friends of mine put together this little <laughs> thing I always thought was kind of fun. Uh, it, it's that's a picture of me, of course. Back when I was a young man, I used to have a mustache. Uh, I, I looked so young, I wore a, grew a mustache because uh, I got stopped by the police one time, and they thought I was too young to be driving, so I started wearing a mustache. But anyway, uh, this this thing says, "Do you know this man? He is a member of a small band of followers of Jesus Christ known as Day Spring Evangelism." better known as cold busters. Uh, watch out for him in, an area, in your area soon. And of course, they got this little circle with the X in it and it's got all the cults 
mention the, the Mormons, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology, local church, uh, Ekinkar, and all, all the way down the line. And so I've been basically doing this kind of uh, Christian apologetics, as Rob mentioned, apologetics work since almost the very beginning as I, I, I started. And of course, when we do this kind of ministry, we've been putting out newsletters and things. And the very first newsletter we ever put out through Christian Answers, I've worked with three different ministries apologetically, but uh, in 1994, we started Christian Answers. And we started putting out a newsletter to go with it. And the very first newsletter we ever put out for our Christian Answers ministry, volume one, number one, uh, was with a certain fella here. Here's a picture of him. Do you recognize this guy, Rob? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Who is that guy? Oh, he's got, he shares the same name as I. <laughs> yeah, he's got the Just same name. Relative, I <laughs> <laughs> so there, there we are. This, is, this newsletter is from 1994. But, of course, I had already been doing videos, as you've already seen, with Rob four years previous to that. But Rob did our very first newsletter, and uh, it was dealing with Roman Catholicism. Uh, and so forth. And we got more recent newsletters. This one's on Seventh Day Heaven. And anyone that wants to know more about our newsletters, just uh, call or write or email or, or get on our website. It's got all our back issues, and you can download them, print them out, whatever you want to do there. It's on BibleQuery.org. Okay, now as we get this show set up to deal with uh, the individual that mainly Rob's going to focus on, uh, I want to mention. Uh, the, the, the person he's mainly going to focus on, and that'll be Hank Hanegraaff, the so-called Bible Answer Man. And I want to mention to folks that uh, we have done an extensive video. It's over five and a half hours long mm. uh, on YouTube. And here's this long video that we put out on Hank Hanegraaff. It's already got over 200,000 views. And uh, it's called Hank Hanegraaff, Walter Martin's Greedy Judas, the fake Bible answer man. And from my perspective, Hanegraaff was never the legitimate heir to Walter Martin's ministry. Walter Martin had a good evangelistic, Bible-believing ministry dealing with uh, Christian apologetics and the cults. And now it's been taken over by someone who I would consider to be a cultist. <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the amazing thing about it. Was Hanegraaff really Walter Martin's hand-picked successor? Or why does Hank make over $250,000 a year? Why did he fire so many key people after he took over in 1989? Why did C or I buy him a $66,000 Lexus sports car in 2004? Is Hanegraaff's personal witness training a plagiarism of evangelism explosion? by D. James Kennedy. Did Hanegraaff actually plagiarize D. James Kennedy's evangelism explosion for his own personal witness training? Next, let's hear from well-known minister, Dr. D. James Kennedy of Coral Ridge Ministries in Florida about this issue. I began to get numerous uh, letters from people telling me that he had been attacking me again on several more occasions on his radio program. He has been doing this off and on for the last three or four years and has attacked me in books and on tapes and uh, his magazine. I have made it a position over 42 years of ministry that though I would take on the atheists and the agnostics and the cultists and the pagans and the humanists and the evolutionists that I never would uh, attack fellow evangelical believers. And so uh, I had called him one time trying to get him to uh, not do that, but he continued to, to do it, and apparently is increasing that attack. And so I finally simply wrote a letter to the people that uh, had responded, ha had sent me letters telling me that he was attacking me, tried to explain uh, what, why what he said wasn't the case. And apparently, and I'm not sure, but somebody said that they think that he took that and put it on the web and made it public and now is accusing me of attacking him, which is utterly absurd because I have been sitting here saying nothing for three or four years while he has continued this assault. When he was with us, he would then represent us to donors anywhere in the country, not just Atlanta. 
Uh, but when he left us and went to Atlanta, he no longer was. Okay, so um, there was no reason to. So he didn't just. He didn't have to. He, he didn't leave the EE program in Atlanta. He actually left that in uh, in Fort Lauderdale. That's correct. Okay. That's um, I remember. That's been. I don't know, 20 years or more ago. Sure. And now, when did you first hear about uh, Hank Hanegraaff's personal witnessing training program? The first time I ever heard of that is when I began to get letters from people telling me that he had, uh, that Hanegraaff had uh, plagiarized my book, Evangelism Explosion, which is the basis of the whole evangelistic, uh, uh, EE Evangelism Explosion ministry all over the world, and that he had come up with uh, a very, very similar uh, program, and I guess that's what he called it, and it was until people began to send me uh, a page of his book and a page of my book right next to it, and another page of his, and a page of mine, and on and on, that uh, I had ever seen it or even heard of it, and uh, they were wanting me. I, I had all kinds of people saying, you really ought to sue this man for plagiarism, and uh, I said then what I have always said, I don't think that's what Christians ought to do. I don't think we're supposed to sue other Christians. And I met him one time at a at a hotel somewhere, I don't remember when or where, and he was trying to explain to me how, how this wasn't really plagiarism. And, uh, and I said to him, Hank, look, forget it, don't worry about it. I have no intention of suing you. I don't believe Christians ought to sue other Christians. So just forget about it. And uh, so that was my uh, my experience with that. Now, do you have a sense of how many years ago it was? I mean, when you first started hearing about this new um, PWT program? Oh, gee, I don't know. Was it uh, 10, 12? 10, 12. I don't know. When did, he, when did he publish it? I don't remember. Well, it's been out um, since he was in Atlanta, because that's when he first started developing it. Well, you know, it could have been longer than that. I, okay. I, don't, know, I don't know when. I started hearing about it when people began to write me letters and tell me about it. Other than that, I'd never heard of it. Now, um, <clears throat> Christian Research Institute and Hank Hanegraaff claims that you gave um, um, Mr. Hanegraaff permission to use evangelism explosion materials to uh, for the development of the personal witnessing training program, uh, either verbal or written uh, authorization. Did you ever do this? No, that is just not the case. Uh, in fact, the matter is, I did, at his request, take it to the board and ask them if they wanted to get... Uh, involved with doing uh, something like this, and uh, they turned it down. And if I had given him permission, then I would ask at that hotel that time, why would he have so belabored the point that this really wasn't plagiarism? Now, I had, uh, I think I had seen the pages set side by side. I never even made an investigation on my own to get a hold of it or anything, but some people had sent me the copy of the pages. And since there was such a startling uh, uh, comparison between the two, you know, I, why was he trying so hard to convince me that this wasn't plagiarism when he could have said to me, well, Jim, you know, this is what I've come up with, and since you gave me permission to use your book any way I want it, uh, I guess you'll recognize the large segments of this coming from your book. He never said that. He kept saying it wasn't plagiarism. Now, apparently, he's saying it was, but he had permission from me. I myself remember when Hanegraaff was covering for former members of Herbert W. Armstrong's Worldwide Church of God as no longer being a cult, when in fact they still were, despite changing a few doctrines. Hanegraaff also went against Walter Martin's stand against the Witness Lee and the local church cultism. Listen to Walter Martin himself speak about this group at the link indicated here. Did you see the local church ad in yesterday's paper? Yeah, I did. And I've already stated my opinion on it, and I'm not going to get into it again. My opinion is unvaried. We ought to pray for the local church. We ought to pray for Witness Lee and for the people that surround him. We ought to love them for Christ's sake and avoid their teachings like the plague that it is. And we should not permit ourselves to get involved in argumentation with them. They are looking for arguments. They are dying to have me take out a half-page ad to answer their harebrained theology. 
and I have no intention of doing it. Just keep one thought in your mind. Every source they quote, which allegedly disproves what we believe, is quoted from people who disagree with them. All they've done is taken them out of context and made it look as if that's the truth. It isn't. The time will come when the truth will be known. In the meantime, Christians should just pray for them and avoid them. Witness Lee's cult will have to be judged by the Holy Spirit. Besides all this, numerous Christian ministers, seminarians, theologians, professors, apologists have disagreed with Anagraph's protection of this Witness Lee heretical cult group such as can be seen here in this open letter which is posted online at http colon double slash www.open dash letter dot org slash a theological letter like this from dozens of christian scholars exposes the magnitude of what kind of theological idiot hanegraaff really is in regard to essential bible doctrine as the viewers at home can see, this open letter written to the leadership of Living Stream Ministry and the local churches outlines some of the essential theological differences that Orthodox Christianity has with Witness Lee's cult group. One is on the very nature of God himself, as you can see there, on the nature of God. Then we see further down the page, on the nature of humanity. And then you have the on the on the next page on the legitimacy of evangelical churches and denominations. And then down near the bottom on lawsuits with evangelical Christians. And then here you have all of the various signers, most of which are PhDs in their theological fields. And uh, Hanegraaff then would obviously disagree with all these people. Hank Hanegraaff really does not deserve to be the president. He was never meant to be the president. And his need to uh, squeeze money out of people is becoming an apparent problem, which has really been going on over the last nine or 10 years. But again, since his uh, taking over in 1989, it's been shown you know, clearly here that uh, he has changed the vision of CRI a lot of the things that uh, were talked about, Walter Martin being the president uh, of the paper, of the, of the CRI Journal, that's been taken out. The fact that uh, you can barely even he find any mention of him on his own website any longer, Walter Martin's website. The idea that um, uh, even though he, he talked in, in such glowing terms at his funeral, he no longer even hardly mentions Walter Martin as the president of CRI. So again, we just see that Hank Hanegraaff was really never was intended to be the president of CRI. These scandals kind of show that the true heart of the man, he, he really does not belong at this helm of this ministry. It is interesting that while I was making this report known throughout the country by way of our national mailing list, and I was getting a lot of requests for it as a result, I got a call one day from an underling who worked at Hanegraaff's outfit. He asked me to stop distributing my Matthew 18 lawsuit report about Hanegraaff. I told him I would if Hanegraaff were to provide me with evidence that he could refute all the allegations against him. The underling told me he would within a few weeks, so in the meantime, I promised to stop making it available. After waiting almost a month and never getting anything from Hanegraaff, I went right back to making the report available. I concluded from that experience that CRI does not keep their promises. What's interesting here is what Walter Martin's own family says about Hank Hanegraaff. And as you can see there in the paperwork before you, Walter Martin's family urges Hank Hanegraaff to step down as head of CRI. Hank Hanegraaff has been asked to step down from his post as president of the Christian Research Institute, CRI, by family members of Dr. Walter Martin, who founded the organization in 1960. A majority of Martin's family members signed a statement asking Hanegraaff to resign. Walter Martin's eldest daughter, Jill Martin Reshi, is a lead critic. A statement calling on Hanegraaff to resign as CRI's president has been signed by Rishi and her husband, as well as other members of Martin's family, including his children, Daniel, Elaine, and Debbie, and 
Walter Martin's widow, Darlene. For more documentation concerning Hank Hanegraaff and CRI, see the Facebook group called Walter Martin, the Original Bible Answer Man, run by Walter Martin's eldest daughter, Jill Martin Reshi. But, uh, but Rob, you and me are no strangers to Hank Hanegraaff right. from the past. Over the last right. two decades, we have done videos against Hank Hanegraaff. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't surprise us that he has apostatized from the faith into the Eastern Orthodox Church. Right. Uh, because he was already a pro-Romanist from way back. Uh, uh, and here's some of our videos that we've done in the past with Rob and myself. We, we see here... Original Bible answer man, Walter Martin says the Roman Catholic Church is corrupt and apostate, but Hank Hanegraaff would never tell you that. No. We had to expose what Walter said because he would never say it on his radio broadcast, mm -hmm. uh, the Bible answer man show. Here's another one we did, an analysis of Hank Hanegraaff and a Christian research institute on Roman Catholicism. And we go through his shows and how he's defending Roman Catholicism and so forth. And we expose the heresies he's promoting. Then we have analysis of Hank Hanegraaff on CRI on Romanism, part two, and the roots of evangelical apostasy. And once again, we're dealing with these. And now this goes back long before he became an Eastern Orthodox convert, mm. uh, which in my opinion, Eastern Orthodoxy is almost like the twin sister of Roman Catholicism with some differences in there, which uh, we'll be discussing some of that as we get into the show. Uh, then we have analysis of Hank Hanegraaff and Norman Geisler versus Walter Martin on Roman Catholicism, part three. And then review of Walter Martin's book on Roman Catholicism, part one, is Romanism an apostate religion or not? Now, here's the funny thing about that. So Rob and me do this video, and then we have a part two to it, a review of Walter Martin's book on Roman Catholicism, part two. Is Romanism an apostate religion or not? Well, see, here's the deal. Here's the original book from 1960 written by Walter Martin, of the, the original Bible answer man. There is this Walter Martin Christian Research Institute, mm -hmm. the whole bit. And... Uh, Hank Hanegraaff never told anybody that this book even existed or the other stuff we already exposed in the previous shows that you and I had done on this subject. But I've got, I'm one of the few that have an actual original copy, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of blessed to have that. It's hard to get these things anymore. But what we did to remedy that, that situation, what we have here on these videos, just to go down the rest of this list, the Virgin Mary, Seven Steps to Godhood versus Catholic Dogma, exposed by Bible answer man Walter Martin. We showed how Walter Martin exposed how they made Mary, you know, through these seven steps into a goddess. Uh, but to remedy the problem that no one can get this book. Now, Rob, you weren't in this video, mm -hmm. but... Uh, I was, and my video guy did the audio, so he's, a, he's got an excellent uh, narrator's voice. So we did Walter's book and called it, we did the whole book in, in audio form with the pages on the screen. The Roman Catholic Church in History by Walter Martin, number one, Pope Peter, question mark, Catholic tradition, and you can also see on your screen the other one we did, the Roman Catholic Church in History by Walter Martin, Number three, Mary, and four, confession, mass, purgatory, etc. Uh, so these, these, these are available particularly on Sermon Audio and YouTube. But on Sermon Audio, you can get a free transcript of the whole book. So if you can't get this book, you can get a free transcript of the whole thing by just going to Sermon Audio and clicking on the view transcript, and it'll be right there in your hands. Okay, also we have uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis is a false gospel, and C.S. Lewis is a false prophet loved by all. Now, I mentioned C.S. Lewis here because Hank Hanegraaff is a big fan of C.S. Lewis. And, and in fact, C.S. Lewis is very uh, lenient towards Roman Catholic dogma, and things like that. And uh, we'll discuss more of that as we go on. And then another one here, Witness Lee and his local church called the cult by Walter Martin, but not by Hank Hanegraaff. Uh, so we're going to get into the facts that uh, Hank Cantergraff has been actually defending a lot of cultic groups that Walter Martin condemned. Mm. And I think uh, money had something to do with that. And, of course, we deal with that in the money aspect. In that first video I, I just pointed out, Hank Cantergraff, the greedy Judas, 
uh, Walter Martin. And in there, I'm going to mention that now. As you can see on your screen, I, I mentioned up here at the top, Hank Hanegraaff ripped off the good ministry of Walter Martin after Walter died suddenly and unexpectedly on June 26, 1989, while at Walter's funeral shortly thereafter. Before that, Hanegraaff had only been a member of Walter's ministry for a couple of years and was not knowledgeable in theology, church history, original biblical languages, cults, or much of anything else since he only had a high school diploma to his name. He did go one semester to a seminary, but then he dropped out. Mm. So that's his theological background at the time of Walter Martin's death. And somehow he ends up with Walter's ministry. Mm. Now, very suspicious, wouldn't you think? As we go on, Walter had hired Hanegraaff to be a fundraiser for the Christian Research Institute, CRI. Previously, Hanegraaff was fortunate that Dr. D. James Kennedy did not sue Hanegraaff for plagiarizing Dr. Kennedy's book, Evangelism Explosion, in a work Hanegraaff called Personal Witness Training. Mm. Now, as you can see on your screen in this five-hour video, and most people don't have time to watch something that long, and I don't blame you, but you can see here we have uh, important details about different things that were going on at different time marks in that long video. So if you want to see things like uh, one hour, 13 minute mark, or you'll see Jay Howard's full interview with Dr. D. James Kennedy concerning Hanegraaff's plagiarism. So you have Dr. Kennedy himself accusing Hanegraaff <laughs> of plagiarism. Uh, so, uh, and then as you can see there on the screen, I, I'm not going to read through all this, but uh, there is one thing I will read though that is kind of of interest because this ties into his conversion to Eastern Orthodoxy. You can see down there where it says at the three hour, 51 minute mark, Hanegraaff removes the original CRI, that's the Christian Research Institute, doctrinal statement, which said that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone. He gets rid of that. Because mm. after all, it's, un, it's unimportant, right? right? Faith alone, Christ alone. I mean, but anyway, he got rid of that on the CRI statement. Thus, the major doctrines of the Protestant Reformation are removed as unnecessary. Mm. And mm. all that's documented right there on that part of the video. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also at the end of the video, you might find, you see this book right here, Hard Questions for the Bible Answer Man. The last part of that video, as you can see on the screen, at the four-hour mark, 408, uh, this book documents how Hanegraaff finagled his way with almost no theological background to be the head of CRI, despite other well-qualified theologians that could have easily taken it, that had worked mm. for him for years. Mm. That were, but somehow he ended up with it. This guy has a whole book on this subject. Mm. It shows exactly how he finagled his way into that position. Mm. Mm. So we're dealing with what I would call a theological shyster. <laughs> and I really mean that. So anyway, uh, with that said, and the table set, uh, I have this paper here. We'll show it on the screen. This gets into the Christian Research Institute has an extensive website. We find this promise from Sierra on the homepage. It talks about a promise. Because of Hanegraaff's compromise with Catholicism, his conversion into uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and things of this nature, it's entitled Double-Minded. And when you listen to Hanegraaff, you find somebody that talks out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. <laughs> and in fact, you even said something about that right. in your while ago, which is, which is fascinating. So oh, I got a paper on that. <laughs> well, we, we have on our website an entire episode of... Uh, CRI's defection from biblical Christianity and endorsement of the Roman Catholic religion step mm -hmm. by yeah, step. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. on our website. Yeah. So here you have a, a guy who finagles his way into taking over Walter Martin's ministry, a good Protestant ministry that attacked Roman Catholicism mm -hmm. and uh, tapes, books, whatever. And instead now, Hanegraaff has thrown all of Walter out, out in the street under the bus mm -hmm. And he's changed it into something completely different. But when he talks, he's trying to be like the ultimate ecumenical man. Mm -hmm. Even though he's apostatized, he denies the faith, uh, he's still trying to act like, hey, nothing's changed. I've wrote, written 16 books and all this stuff. And you're, you Protestants are still my evangelical brethren. Mm -hmm. and, but he's always saying almost two opposite things at the same time to try to get everybody to love him just like 
C.S. Lewis did, as we document in our video about him. So I don't want to turn up because we're limited on time here. I could say a ton more, but I've got a lot of material that I would like to go through here, but we'll put that in as an, an audio edit later to save time to give uh, Rob ultimate time uh, to finish this video with the pre presentation he wants to make. So go ahead, Rob, take okay. over the show. Thank you, Larry. I want to address uh, all of you Christians out there directly with the information that I have to share with you because I think it is of utmost importance for you to be well equipped, to understand the Bible correctly, and to uh, go to the scriptures and search and see if these things are in fact true. So if you have a Bible nearby, I would encourage you to get a Bible and sit down, open it up to James chapter 2. We will be in James chapter 2 toward the end of my short presentation, and I want to go through that chapter with you in order to help you understand uh, Mr. Hanegraaff and what I think he has done to corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ in his latest YouTube video. Most of you know that Hank Hanegraaff, who is the director of Christian Research Institute has defected from evangelicalism and joined the Eastern Orthodox religion. There were more than a few analyses of Mr. Hanegraaff's departure from mainstream evangelicalism. Dr. John MacArthur openly criticized the move and insinuated in no uncertain terms that the director of CRI had deviated from the gospel of grace. In response to MacArthur's criticism, Hank Hanegraaff composed a video which is still up on YouTube explaining his shift while correcting MacArthur and defending the theology of the Eastern Orthodox religion. Hank begins his defense by insisting that Eastern Orthodoxy does not believe a lot of the things taught and promulgated by the Roman Catholic religion. Hank mentions that there is no purgatory, papal infallibility, the immaculate conception of Mary, and celibacy of the priesthood in Eastern Orthodoxy. This is not quite accurate, as we shall see. However, the main point of contention brought up by John MacArthur is that Eastern Orthodoxy does not believe that the ungodly are justified by faith alone. In his analysis of Eastern Orthodoxy, MacArthur brings up decree number 13 of the Council of Jerusalem, which states the following, quote, We believe a man to be not simply justified through faith alone, but through faith which works through love, that is to say, through faith and works. But the idea that faith can fulfill the function of a hand that lays hold on the righteousness which is in Christ and then can apply it unto us for salvation, we know to be far from all orthodoxy. That citation is taken from Decree 13 of the Council of Jerusalem, which is a primary council of the Eastern Orthodox religion and still a plank in the foundational doctrinal statement of Eastern Orthodoxy. So MacArthur brings up this statement from the Eastern Orthodox plank of their theological platform. Let me repeat the first part to you. Decree 13 of the Council of Jerusalem says, we believe a man to be not simply justified through faith alone, but through faith which works through love, that is to say, through faith and works. In other words, the Eastern Orthodox religion is committed to the proposition that a man is not simply justified by faith alone, but he is justified by faith which works through love, that is to say, through faith and works. Now this Decree 13 is taken from the Council of Jerusalem, which is a part of the doctrinal position of Eastern Orthodoxy. In response to this point, Hank Hanegraaff does two things. First, he recognizes the quote from Decree 13, but only quotes a part of it. Then he dismisses the whole issue of the Council of Jerusalem, explaining that it was centered upon a patriarch of Constantinople named Cyril Lucaris, who was leaning too far toward Calvinistic teachings. 
Now, this is true as far as that goes. Cyril Lucaris was leaning toward Calvinistic teachings. He was the patriarch of Constantinople. But what exactly was the Council of Jerusalem so disturbed about? Here is the portion of the chapter from Lucaris that so incensed the Council of Jerusalem. Cyril of Lucaris says this, We believe that man is justified by faith and not by works. But when we say faith, we understand the correlative or object of faith, which is the righteousness of Christ, which, as if by hand, faith apprehends and applies unto us for our salvation. In other words, the Council of Jerusalem was extremely agitated by the words of Cyril Lucaris, patriarch of Constantinople. Why? Because this particular patriarch in that day believed that a man is justified by faith and not by works, and that faith was a hand that apprehends and applies unto us the righteousness of Christ for justification. So upset was the council by that decree, by that statement of Lucaris, that they called the council in the first place and issued their statement, we believe a man is not simply justified through faith alone. The council of Jerusalem was offended by justification by faith alone. This is not simply a Calvinistic issue, as Hank Hanegraaff would have us believe. It goes to the heart of evangelical soteriology. One does not have to be a Calvinist to see that this is clearly a matter that changes the meaning of the gospel of the New Testament. Hanegraaff is embracing right now and has converted to a religion that believes Cyril was wrong and that believes the ground of justification is composed of faith plus works. That's the deceit. That's the shyster false <laughs> apologist speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Clearly, Hanegraaff is defending the proposition that faith cannot lay hold of the righteousness of Christ and apply it unto us for salvation. This is what upset Dr. John MacArthur so much. The Council of Jerusalem, under the direction of the Patriarch of Jerusalem, stated boldly that faith cannot lay hold of the righteousness of Christ and apply it unto us for salvation. Hank Hanegraaff has joined this religion, which makes this bold statement, which is contrary to the very heart of biblical Christianity. Cyril Lucaris was branded as a heretic because he believed the righteousness of Christ being applied to the penitent alone justifies and saves the faithful. He was branded a heretic and banned for saying he believes in justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, and that the righteousness of Christ is the only ground of justification. Mr. Hanegraaff sidesteps the issue and blatantly ignores the fact that Eastern Orthodoxy does not embrace faith alone for justification, and he calls himself the Bible answer man. But what else does Eastern Orthodoxy teach? This is not all. Eastern Orthodoxy affirms the necessity of baptism for salvation as well as infant baptism for the remission of original sin of the infant. We quote, We believe holy baptism was initiated by the Lord and is conferred in the name of the Holy Trinity to be of the highest necessity, for without it none is able to be saved. Eastern Orthodoxy teaches that one cannot be saved unless he is baptized. This is the religion Hank Hanegraaff has embraced and defected to. I quote again, And therefore baptism is necessary even for infants, since they also are subject to original sin, and without baptism, infants are not able to be saved. This is full-blown Roman Catholicism, baptismal regeneration. This is the religion Hank Hanegraaff has converted himself to. We quote again, and those that are not regenerated 
since they have not received the remission of hereditary sin, are of necessity subject to eternal punishment and consequently cannot, without baptism, be saved. Baptismal regeneration for adults, baptismal regeneration for infants, without baptism they cannot be saved. Is this the teaching of the New Testament? Is this what you want the director of Christian Research Institute to believe in? Well, you've got it if you want it, because he's just defected into this religion. Now, how close is Eastern Orthodoxy to Rome? While mentioning that Eastern Orthodox religion empties itself of some trappings of Rome, Hanegraaff conveniently leaves out what is retained of Romanism in Eastern Orthodoxy. Eastern Orthodoxy teaches there are seven sacraments. They are holy baptism, confirmation, priesthood, unbloody sacrifice, marriage, penance, and holy oil. Eastern Orthodoxy also believes in transubstantiation. Aside from departure from the essence of salvation, the Eastern Orthodox religion also affirms the doctrine of transubstantiation just as the Roman Catholic religion. And I quote, He is not present typically, this is from Eastern Orthodox theology, he is not present typically, speaking of the Lord, at the Lord's table, nor figuratively, nor by superabundant grace, as in the other mysteries, nor by bare presence, as some of the fathers have said concerning baptism, or by impanation, so that the divinity of the word is united in the set forth bread of the Eucharist hypostatically, as the followers of Luther most ignorantly and wretchedly suppose, but truly and really, so that after the consecration of the bread and of the wine, the bread is transmuted, transubstantiated, and converted and transformed into the true body itself of the Lord, which was born in Bethlehem of the ever-Virgin, was baptized in the Jordan, suffered and was buried, etc., etc., etc. Any doubt that the Eastern Orthodox religion does not believe in transubstantiation can only be maintained by somebody who's never read their theology or somebody who's a shyster and doesn't want you to believe that he has joined such a religious organization. Mr. Hanegraaff is incredibly non-credible. And there is one more thing about the credibility of Mr. Hanegraaff. As mentioned, he claims that Eastern Orthodoxy does not believe as the Romanists do, that purgatory is a necessity. While Eastern Orthodox will not use the word purgatory, we read this from the Council of Jerusalem. You decide, and I quote, And the souls of those involved in mortal sins, who have not departed in despair, but while still living in the body, their souls depart into Hades and there endure punishment due to the sins they have committed. But they are aware of their future release from there and are delivered by the supreme goodness through the prayers of the priest, the good works which the relatives of each do for their departed, especially the unbloody sacrifice benefiting the most, which each offers particularly for his relatives that have fallen asleep and which the Catholic and Apostolic Church offers daily for all alike. Of course, it is understood that we do not know the time of their release. We know and believe that there is deliverance for such from their direful condition and that before the common resurrection and judgment, but, we know not, uh, but when, we know not. How is it that souls involved in mortal sins in the Eastern Orthodox religion depart into Hades and there endure punishment due to their sins and they will be guaranteed a future release on the basis of prayers of priests, good works of their relatives, and masses said in their favor. How is that different from the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory? There is absolutely no difference. That's precisely what the Roman Catholic religion teaches about purgatory. Those who die with unconfessed sins, those who die with mortal sins unconfessed, will go to purgatory where they'll be cleansed. They can have their time reduced on earth by masses said for them, by good works of their relatives, and by uh, unbloody sacrifice 
of the Mass in the Roman Catholic religion as well. There's absolutely no difference just in terminology. Hank Hanegraaff is deceitful. And he's a shyster, and he refuses to face the truth of this. And it's incredibly disingenuous for him to do a video on YouTube and say that Eastern Orthodoxy does not hold to purgatory. Of course, they don't use the word, but everything else is purgation. What are the scriptures that Hank Hanegraaff must now embrace as a member of the Eastern Orthodox religion? Does Hank Hanegraaff believe that there are only 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 books of the New Testament recognized as the canon of the text as all Christians believe? Or does he believe in the additional books of the Apocrypha added by the Roman Catholic religion? What does the Eastern Orthodox religion think of the canon of the text? You judge for yourself. I quote, Following the rule of the Catholic Church, we call sacred scripture all those which Cyril Lucaris collected from the Synod of Laodicea and enumerated. They like Cyril at this point. Adding to scripture those which he foolishly and ignorantly or rather maliciously called Apocrypha. They don't like him at that point because Cyril evidently recognized the Apocryphal books don't belong in the canon of the text. But Eastern Orthodox adds the wisdom of Solomon, Judith, Tobit, the history of the dragon, Bell of the dragon, the history of Susanna, the Maccabees, the wisdom of Sirach. Quote, we judge these also to be with the other genuine books of divine scripture, genuine parts of scripture. For ancient custom, or rather the Catholic Church, which has delivered to us as genuine the sacred gospels and the other books of scripture, has undoubtedly delivered these also as parts of Scripture, and the denial of these books is the same as the rejection of those books. Now you determine for yourself, given this evidence, does the Eastern Orthodox religion hold to the same canon of the text as Christianity? They most certainly do not. They add to the canon all these books, all the apocryphal books, and treat them on the same level of authority, the same level of inspiration as the recognized canon of the text by virtually 100% of Christians not involved with the Roman Catholic religion or the Eastern Orthodox religion. Hank Hanegraaff has embraced this religion hook, line, and sinker. So he now embraces a different canon of the text, a different way of justification and salvation, baptismal regeneration, the purgation of one in purgatory after death, and what else does he embrace? Hank Hanegraaff prides himself in the fact that he has memorized great parts of Scripture. I had a seminary professor who looked at one of the students in our class who had stood up and said, Doctor, I have gone through the Bible five times in the last five years. I go through the Bible every year completely. And the professor said to him, that is commendable. But how many times has the Bible gone through you? That's the main point. I wonder how many times the Bible has gone through Mr. Hank Hanegraaff. How can a man who runs an apologetic organization called Christian Research Institute be so disingenuous and have such moxie to go on YouTube and argue with Dr. John MacArthur over his conversion to the Eastern Orthodox religion on the basis that it is not Roman Catholic, on the basis that it does, in fact, firm most of the historic tenets of Christianity, knowing that it denies justification by faith and faith alone. I want you to open your Bibles to James chapter 2, because Hank Hanegraaff has memorized the entire second chapter of James, and he has devoted the bulk of his YouTube rebuttal to Dr. MacArthur by quoting and commenting on James chapter 2. The burning question of James chapter 2 is this. Does James chapter 2 teach that we are justified by works? Does James chapter 2 teach we are justified by faith plus works, 
That's Hanegraaff's understanding of it. Or does James chapter 2 teach that we are justified by a faith that works? What does the text teach? If you're in James chapter 2, let's begin in verse 14. James 2.14, this is where it all begins with the Roman Catholic religion, the Roman Catholic apologist, and now with Hank Hanegraaff, the so-called Bible Answer Man. James writes these words, What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? There is a kind of faith that does not justify. It is a faith void of works. When James asks, can that faith save him, he expects a negative answer. No, it cannot save him. James now then illustrates faith without works and says that it is useless. Let's read verse 15 and 16 together. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? This kind of faith is useless because it does not bear fruit or good works. At the point where faith should be alive and useful, it is dead. Verse 17, so indeed, the faith, if it has not works, is dead by itself. There is a kind of faith that is basically dead. This is James' entire point, because it is all alone, having no good works or no fruit to bear. James illustrates that faith without works is dead because there's not life in it. It cannot shown to be alive because it bears no works or fruit. When James says such faith is dead, he means it. It cannot save the bearer of it. This kind of faith cannot justify or save anyone. He goes on in verse 18 by illustrating the point and cementing it home to us further. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. It's impossible to show that you have biblical faith that saves without showing the works that follow. James says it's a dead faith if there aren't any works. I'll show you my faith by my works. If you don't want to show me your faith by your works, how are you going to show me your faith? You can't. It's a dead faith. It bears no works. Dead faith shows nothing. In fact, dead faith, ironically, is shown to be dead by what it cannot show. And this is James' point. Dead faith is hopeless and useless. He cements the point further in verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Believing that there is one God is worthless. It is a faith shared with demons. There is no vibrancy or dynamic to dead faith. It's dead. That's James' point. You can't miss it. Let's move on to verse 20. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is barren? A barren woman cannot give birth. Barren faith cannot show works, or bear fruit. Faith without work is barren. It simply cannot produce. It is a useless faith. James could not say it any clearer. He could not give greater illustrations. He could not cement this home to our hearts more than he already has. Now, James wants to make the point even further in our minds. He cites Abraham in verse 21. What's not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. At this juncture, we have to make a decision because James says these words, was not Abraham, our father, justified by works? Is James shifting 
from a faith that works to a justification by works. Yes, if the verse stops here. If James stops here, we would have to say he's made an enormous shift, a cataclysmic change in his thinking, and he is now introducing a justification by works that is much better than a faith that is dead. James would be introducing a completely new thought here, but happily, the passage doesn't stop here. Let's read 21 in conjunction with 22. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see, and this is an explanation of what he's just said in 21, you see that faith was working with his work. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected, or faith was completed. Faith is brought to a completed discharge as faith was working with his works. The works showed the faith to be active and alive. Faith motivated the works. Faith was working with the works. Faith was accomplished and completed working with the works. This is what James is teaching. He's teaching that faith is accomplished, faith is completed, faith is discharged, working with its works. And verse 23 is critical to our analysis of this passage. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. James is telling us that Abraham's faith, as Abraham believed God, was not empty. It wasn't alone. It wasn't useless. It wasn't a dead faith. Though it was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness in Genesis 18 without one single work, its grand showing took place in Genesis 22 when by that faith, which really works, Abraham offered up Isaac. Abraham was justified by faith alone in Genesis 18 and shown to have been justified by faith alone when his faith worked with his works and it offered up Isaac. It wasn't a dead faith. It was a faith that bore this tremendous fruit in the life of Abraham offering up Isaac. Abraham's faith was perfected by his work and was shown to be real by his works. That's the whole point. Faith without works is dead. Faith working with works shows that the faith is real, and the real faith is the faith that justifies the ungodly. Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Again, if this verse were all we had, then James would be switching from a dead faith that does not save to salvation by works. But this verse is the same as verse 21. Was not our father Abraham justified by works? James labors to explain what he means in verses 22 and 23. Faith was working with works, and as a result of works, faith was completed. Incidentally, I should add to this. Roman Catholic scholars get very haughty about this verse. They say, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. This is the clarion call of the Roman apologist in any debate. Don't you know James 2.24? That should settle the issue for you. Well, our response is twofold. In the first place, James is not teaching that a man is justified by works. He's teaching that a man is justified by a faith that works, a faith that works his work with his works, and produces those works as evidence of true faith. But secondly, Rome doesn't believe that a man is justified by works. That's their denial. We accuse them of teaching a justification by works because of their meritorious understanding of sacramental grace. So if they want to have it their own way, then they're falling into the same trap that they're trying to escape. If they want to say that James is teaching a man is justified by works, then they're defeating their denial that their religion teaches a merit-based sacramental salvation. Nobody believes that 224 teaches 
a man is justified by works. Not Eastern Orthodox and not Roman Catholicism. What Eastern Orthodox teaches and what Roman Catholicism, te Catholicism teaches is man is justified by faith plus works or works plus faith. They never teach a man is justified by works. And yet this is exactly what James says in James 2.24. So if you can massage 2.24 incorrectly, we certainly can massage it correctly. James 2.24 standing on its own doesn't make any sense to Rome any more than it makes sense to us. James does not teach that a man is justified by works, and yet this is exactly what he says. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Rome has to do something with it. They do by saying it's faith plus works. We have to do something with it, and we follow the context and say, you've missed it. It's not faith plus works. It's a faith that works, and there's a difference between the two. So is James teaching a justification by works? No. Is James teaching a justification by faith plus works? No. There's no formula in scripture that says a man's works plus his faith are added together to equal a justifying verdict. On the contrary, a man is justified by faith alone, apart from works of the law. God's justification is not dependent upon meritorious works that we do, not good works done in faith or anything else. This is clear from the rest of the New Testament. Don't hang James on this. He's not teaching justification by works plus faith. Is James teaching that a man is justified by a faith that is working with works in order to be completed? Yes, he is. That's what he's teaching. In other words, we are justified by a faith that is completed or brought to accomplishment by works. It is a faith that works. Context demands that James is contrasting a dead faith with a live faith. The dead faith is alone, barren, useless, unable to save, and indeed, if the faith has no works, it is dead by itself and the faith of demons. In essence, faith that works with works to completion will fulfill the nature of true faith, and in the case of Abraham, justify his justification, and it will for us as well. In memorizing the second chapter of the book of James, Hank Hanegraaff comes to the conclusion that we are not justified by faith alone. We're justified by faith plus works. That's another gospel, and that's the same gospel of the religion he has defected to, and that's the gospel of the Roman Catholic religion. And that's why I'm making this video, to point out to you that he has departed, as John MacArthur has said so eloquently, from the gospel of the grace of God. Let me remind you what John MacArthur said in his opening salvo against Mr. Hanegraaff in the first page of what I read this evening. I want to get it correctly from John MacArthur. Dr. MacArthur openly criticized the defection of Mr. Hanegraaff and insinuated in no uncertain terms that the director of CRI has deviated from the gospel of grace. I concur wholeheartedly, and that's why I'm making this video. I hope you stayed long enough to search the scriptures through, read James 2 over and over and over again, take it to your heart, compare it with the writings of the rest of the New Testament, and I think you'll come to the same conclusion. James is not teaching justification by works, nor is he teaching justification by works plus faith. He's teaching that we are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. The reformers were right. They were correct. They analyzed it properly, and we're not giving it up to anybody. Thank you for your time. Amen to all that. Uh, final thoughts here. Uh, I'll have some clips and things coming up from uh, the dividing line with 
Dr. James White, who I think is a real Christian apologist, probably, in my opinion, number one Christian apologist out there in the world living today. And uh, so I'll be playing some clips from that. But in one of those clips, he mentions that Hanegraaff had one of these life-changing moments in his conversion of Eastern Orthodoxy that uh, was sort of like a, a Watchman Nee experience because he, he heard what Watchman Nee said, which was, life matters more than truth. That you and your wife were chrismated at St. Nic Nicterios Greek Orthodox Church there in Charlotte. And I was wondering if you would um, answer that, because uh, there's quite a bit of conflict on the board as to whether or not this is true. Well, I, I don't know anything about uh, what, what, what you're communicating with respect to this individual or this post or ha have no knowledge of that. But, yeah, I mean, I am now a member of an Orthodox Church, uh, but nothing has changed in my faith. I have been attending an Orthodox Church for a long time, uh, for over two years, and uh, really as a result of what happened when I went to China. Many, many years ago, I saw Chinese Christians who were deeply in love with the Lord. And I learned that while they may not have had as much intellectual acumen or knowledge as I did, they had life. And so I learned that while truth matters, life matters more. And I remember flying back from China uh, after spending time with just common people who had a deep, intense love for the Lord and wondering whether I even a Christian. Uh, I was comparing uh, my ability to communicate truth with their deep and abiding love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, uh, one man, by the way, said to me, truth matters, life matters more. In other words, it is not just knowing about Jesus Christ, it is experiencing the resurrected Christ. And as a result of that, I, uh, I started studying uh, what was communicated by the progeny of Watchman Nee with respect to theosis, and that drove me back to the early Christian church. And I suppose over that period of time, I have fallen ever more in love with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's sort of like my wife. I've never been more in love with my wife than I am today, and I've never been more in love with my Lord Jesus Christ than I am today. And uh, so I've I've been impacted by the whole idea of knowing Jesus Christ, experiencing Jesus Christ, and partaking of the graces of Jesus Christ through the Eucharist or the Lord's table. Now, uh, okay, I want you to hear what he's saying. Truth matters, life matters more. I want you to think about what that means. I mean, again, we, we live in a day of, of pithy sayings. But pithy sayings have to have a meaning if they're going to be relevant for Christians who follow him who is the truth. How can you distinguish between the two? And so the person looks at that and goes, well, what I'm missing is because I don't have something more. And so you go looking for something more, you find the smells and bells, and this is, here's where the depth is, here's where the beauty is, and that's what you're attracted to. The problem is that beautiful liturgy and all the symbolism doesn't have the necessary truth content in regards to what scripture really is, in regards to how a person is made right before God. It has enough elements, however, to maintain itself. I mean, I said last time, give the Orthodox their props. They're actually Trinitarians. They really are Trinitarians. Much more than the vast majority of Roman Catholics are, or even Protestants for that matter. They're actually Trinitarians. Now, are they, do they then consistently follow that through to see what the gospel is? And, and how? No, there's the problem. But hey, give them props. They've got, they've got enough truth to hold the edifice together and make it attractive. But then what attracts you to it leads you away from fundamental, sound, biblical teaching. We talked about this last time. But you cannot separate truth, and life. So here Hank is saying, I, I saw there was, I was missing something. So rather than looking more deeply at what he should be doing within the context he was in, he starts looking for something else. Not just he, but he and his family start looking for something else. I think that's probably an important part here. Mm. <laughs> now, uh, mm. if, if you're, you're basing a conversion experience on something like that, Life matters more than truth. 
And, you know, that's, that's kind of an astonishing thing. And, of course, uh, uh, Watchman Nee, uh, his famous disciples, Witness Lee, started right. the local church, which Walter Martin of the Christian Research Institute was, said was a, a cult mm-hmm. and taught yeah. heresy. And, of course, we know from that video I mentioned before that uh, Hanegraaff has, has uh, verified a lot of different cults mm. that deny the gospel uh, yeah. for uh, monetary considerations and things of that nature, which yeah. we've said. Uh, it's a very dishonest type of uh, way of running a so-called Christian apologetics ministry. Well, it's devastating because how many people have benefited from CRI over the years because they're never all wrong in everything. There's a lot of good stuff that Hanegraaff has put out, and there's a lot of good reason to think that CRI is fairly reputable. But when he does this, it all falls apart. I would encourage CRI board of directors to fire the guy, and I would encourage all those who support yeah, CRI already, to give it up. He already threw out everybody that might have opposed him, and he's got his own little yes man set up over there. So he's got he's not going anywhere. Now Walter Martin's family has called for him to resign, yeah. but he's not doing that because that's his money cow. And when you talk out of both sides of your mouth and you're trying to appeal to everybody, evangelicals, Roman Catholics, mm-hmm. Eastern Orthodoxy, he uh, he passes on a lot of these uh, non-Christian cults because uh, it's when you're ecumenical, you get more support because right. you're trying to. It's like the C.S. Lewis method right. with mere Christianity, the minimum, the you know common denominator uh and of course we know c.s lewis said well even buddhists can make it uh, to heaven so uh, well we're going to have to pray the lord takes them down because there are too many people that rely upon some sort of solid christian apologetics to help them along in life we need christian apologetics we need to give an answer for the hope that is within us we need to be careful with scripture but goodness me you cannot sell out justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, for our justification. But he did. I know he it. Did that. That's, he but did. He, and he has joined to, a religion he's, he's, that did. He's, he's, yeah, he's an Eastern Orthodox. So yeah. he has to throw out uh, and sell out the gospel. Ah. Yeah, I mean, that's just part of the way it works, don't you understand? But yeah. see, now, I'm going to finish this show with uh, just a, a brief comment or two from you on the fact that uh, there's a lot of people that are too intimidated to actually say somebody's a false Christian. Uh, uh, you know, Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Right. And so you can, and it says in uh, 1 uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, the spiritual man judges all things. Right. Right. You know, and so I look at his whole life over these, these decades he's been there, and we've done all these zillions of videos, as I already showed, against him, showing all the heresies in the past, and now he's, had, now he's done this. I would say his fruits testified to the fact that the guy was never really born again or spiritually saved in the first place. People say, oh, you can't judge people like that. But Jesus says we'll know them by their fruits. And their doctrine of the gospel and everything else, uh, we see it in Galatians chapter 1. You know, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, for instance, another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. Yeah. These yeah. things tell us who the false prophets are. Right. And uh, well, in a classic to, case yeah. of 1 yeah. John chapter 2, verse 9, they went out uh, from, from us. us. They weren't of us. Right. So what are your final comments along that line? Can you judge somebody as to being truly born again when it's, there's no sign of any repentance of it over decades of time? Right. Well, I think that we are to judge with the righteous judgment. Mm-hmm. Okay, Not all judging is out of bounds according to the New Testament. Jesus himself said that you are to judge with a righteous judgment. And the Apostle Paul, if he was not able to judge, which we would call discern, it's a better word for us to use because mm-hmm. judgment usually is, is a pejorative term and it's used in a negative mm-hmm. uh, 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 conversation. But let's just use the word discernment. Are Christians to be discerning? You bet they are. Are we to examine a person's fruits? You bet we are. Are we to understand that, that if anybody teaches or preaches a gospel contrary to that which the Apostle Paul taught or preached, that person is a curse. Let so what anathema. did the Apostle Paul preach? If the Apostle Paul didn't preach justification by faith alone in Christ alone, 
He didn't preach anything, in my opinion. Yeah, but Hanegraaff took that out of the CRI statement. That I know. Wrong. He took it out, and he substitutes it with James 2. His rendition of James 2, faith plus works, justifies the ungodly. Yeah, but you can't discern that he's a false prophet by him simply denying the gospel, can you? Yes. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> Anybody. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Hank Hanegraaff, or I don't care if it's... Uh, C.S. Lewis or Sinclair Lewis. It doesn't matter who he is. If he departs from sola fide and sola scriptura, I don't want any part of him, and neither does the New Testament. He's a false prophet. He's a false teacher. He's got to be brought into submissive to the Word of God. And if he's not submissive to the Word of God, then he's a, he's a purveyor of false hope. Yeah, but false prophets make a lot of money in this life. It just doesn't do much good in the next. Yeah. Well, I would say there's one who judges righteously. Yeah. And, and the Lord knows. Yes. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. will take care of it. He will, re he and, will repay. And all, all we can do is just sit here Warn and the say, brethren. Yeah, over and over again. That's right. Watch it. Paul's whole life was consumed with straightening out the doctrine in That's the right. churches that he planted. That's right. Let alone other people. So... It's always been with us. He said, from among you men will arise and teach false doctrine and lead, 20, yeah, and lead many astray. So, uh, Hank, if you ever get a hold of this video, and I hope you do, I'll have somebody clips it out and sends it to you, respond. Please respond. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from your rendition of what you have joined. And don't forget, we're reading Eastern Orthodox theology right along with you. So give a response. We'd love to hear from you. Well, all I can say is he's, he's an unrepentant sinner. He's uh, departed from the faith, just like Dr. MacArthur mm. has pointed out. Okay. And so from my perspective, and there's other people that would disagree with me, but I, I can declare that this guy is a cultist running a counter-cult ministry, which right. is an oxymoron, yeah. to yeah. say the it least. Is. It is. <laughs> so anyway. But uh, I, I recall Luther in his commentary on Galatians, in a footnote at the bottom, said something to the effect, whoever is troubling the Christians of Galatia, they must have been awfully good because that church was planted by the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. That's okay, right. That's they right. must have been awfully good. Awfully good false prophets. Maybe good wordsmiths. False prophets are awfully good. Yeah. So, not surprisingly that he can Slip his way through all this. Oh yeah, yeah. But and God, you're talking will, out of both sides of your mouth all the time and appealing to everybody the yeah, best way you can. Yeah, the Lord will and the wordsmithing and all that stuff. It uh, it works to make him a lot of money, but I don't I don't really have a whole lot of hope for him in the next life. Well, the Lord will raise up nobody's like you and me to shoot him down. <laughs> That's well, awesome. Praise God, He's kept us around for 29 I years know. so far. I We're know. still going. So I what know. can I say? All right, with that, brother, thank you again for being with us here today. You're more than welcome, thank Larry. You. Good to be with you. Oh, thank you for it. the opportunity. Thank you for the birthday present of being here. You know. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. And uh, for all you folks out there, join us again next time for Christian Answers Presents. And remember this, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And, and, and it's not through water baptism or uh, listening to, you know, joining some cult group or anything like that. It's the Jesus of the Bible. It's believing him and his gospel. And through doing those things that the scripture talks about, not smooth talking religious shysters or anything like that. Just stay with Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. God bless you all. Join us again next time. God bless. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.